Good morning, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to today's ICCF Congressional Briefing about nuclear energy. I'm Christy Harbin with the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. ICCF Group serves as the Secretariat to the Bipartisan International Conservation Caucus and Oceans Caucus in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. We also provide support to the leadership of the U.S. Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. In addition, we support 23 parliamentary con conservation caucuses globally. To learn more, please go to our website, internationalconservation.org. Our virtual event today is part of IC ICCF Group's Energies and Forest Program, through which we convene leaders and key stakeholders to advance constructive bipartisan policy solutions that support the environment. People are increasingly talking about net zero these days and policymakers are wisely looking for ways to achieve it. Natural gas, wind, solar, hydro are all gonna be an important part of that conversation. But today we're gonna to talk about the important role that nuclear energy plays. We're going to discuss technology innovation as well as the challenges and opportunities that the industry currently faces. Many thanks to everyone participating in our discussion this morning. Uh, a very special thanks to Congressman John Curtis of Utah for being here today in person to share his thoughts and insights. A thank you to Senator Whitehouse and Congressman Young for providing their remarks beforehand. Uh, in our second part of our program, we're also thrilled to host an expert panel with direct knowledge on these issues, with experts from the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, ClearPath, Idaho National Lab, and a former senior official from the U.S. De Development Finance Corporation. Without further ado, I'd like to invite some pre-recorded remarks from Senator Whitehouse, who's been a strong champion for conservation issues in the Senate, and can speak to the important role of nuclear energy in our clean energy future. Thank you to the International Conservation Caucus Foundation for convening this briefing on the nuclear innovation progress that we have made in the Senate in bipartisan fashion. Uh, it has actually been quite successful. We are trying to move beyond traditional nuclear technologies to modern, newer, next generation nuclear technologies, ones that are safe, ones that are carbon free, and most importantly, perhaps, ones that have the promise to allow us to work through our nuclear waste stockpile and take what is now a hazardous liability for our country and turn it into a positive benefit, uh, a lot of electricity. It has been my pleasure to work with um, Chairman Crapo and Chairman Barrasso on the two nuclear innovation bills that we put forward successfully. One helps improve the partnership between the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the industry and the research facilities uh, in the academic world to help move that progress forward of nuclear innovation. And the second changes the Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission's uh, process so that different forms of nuclear technology can move more readily through the approval process. The way I've always described that is that uh, it's a little bit like driving your Tesla in to have its carburetor checked. That doesn't work for these technologies. These are the new Tesla technologies and the old carburetor checking tests simply don't apply. So both of them are in place. Both of them are going forward. We're starting to see the innovation happen and it happened in a very bipartisan way. Uh, we cannot overlook nuclear energy as an element in our plan to defeat climate change. And we certainly have to do something about the nuclear waste stockpiles that are littered across various sites across this country. Um, nuclear innovation stands to be a way for us to address both of those urgent problems. And again, it has a strong bipartisan foundation. Uh, the International Conservation Caucus Foundation has been very helpful in trying to keep this bipartisanship going, try to make sure that we can find on this and other issues common ground. So let me say a closing thank you to ICCF and wish you all well. Thank you for your support on the work that I have done through ICCF. We look forward to doing many more things together. Great, thanks for those comments, Senator, and, and thank you for your leadership in Congress. 
Uh, for our next speaker, we go to the other side of Capitol Hill with Congressman Don Myung of Alaska uh, to share his thoughts as well on nuclear energy and the role that it plays in this conversation. Hello, I'm Congressman Don Young, and thanks for asking me to speak to the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. I want to thank you for setting up this foundation because I think you have the answers and solutions to a lot of our problems. We all know that the world has a shortage of energy, and that's sad because there isn't a shortage of energy. There's a shortage of applying the needs and applying the, the uh, part of the demand for it, and we have all those natural resources. You think first, I believe big time in hydro, maybe old fashioned, but I love hydro. Then we go into, I think the most important one is nuclear energy. And we have to face up to the fact because the environmental community is trying to stop all fossil fuels, which will not happen. Uh, there may be a slight slowdown, but remember there's only 19% of a tank of uh, oil, 44 gallons, goes into propulsion. Most of it goes into other factors, plastics and asphalt and medicines and all kinds of different things. And the people try say no to nuclear, and I'm saying, yes, we have to have both. We have to have fossil fuels, we have to have renewables, and but we have to have nuclear power because it's the cheapest and cleanest of all. Uh, I know in Alaska we were trying and have been trying, and I think we're making some progress of putting these small uh, silo uh, reactors in the ground in the small areas so we can get electricity for about two cents a kilowatt instead of 74 cents and it will work. We just got to get over that hump. So the environmentalists realize they can't have no fossil fuels, that will not work. They can't have fewer fossil fuels, but to replace it, you've got to have nuclear power. It can be done safely. It's not going to be the old fashioned type plants, you know, with Chernobyl, etc. These are small, well-organized plants that last for a long time. Very similar to our um, plants that we have in the nuclear subs. Uh, I've often said we should have used those, but these are new systems being developed now and probably mostly in Japan and China and we're trying to get some of those to be actually utilized in, in the great uh, United States of America. Have a little problem with regulatory agencies. We have to work on that. I think we have that answer and I'm asking you to keep pursuing it. Uh, I know right now there's a big push for we're going to have renewables. Well, okay, let's have renewables. It's all. We have to have all forms of energy. Cheap power is a new society. Cheap power is a free society. No power makes a, a society that's dependable upon one source. Look at Texas, what happened to Texas. And the windmills went down the whole bit because they hadn't had a proper grid. We can make a proper grid and have the proper energy available for all of you. So anyway, God bless you all and keep up the work. I'm here. Anything you want me to do for you, call me. Let me know. The Congress from all of Alaska is big in the energy. It is a solution to any of our problems. God bless you all and have a good one. Any of our problems. God bless you all and have a good one. Wonderful. Thank you, Congressman. Last but certainly not least, we're thrilled to be joined this morning by Congressman John Curtis of Utah, who is doing tremendous work in the House of Representatives, working very closely with his colleagues on both sides of the political aisle to advance constructive solutions on climate, the environment, and energy. Thanks so much for your time, Congressman, and for your leadership. We're grateful to, that you can join us today, and I'd love to turn it over to you for your thoughts. Thank you, and good morning to you and to everybody listening. Uh, I might just mention that uh, I represent Utah's third congressional district, and there are two very unique uh, features about this district. The first is we are the youngest district in the country. The average age of my uh, constituents is uh, 27 years of age. And we're near the most conservative. We're in an R plus 26, maybe not the most, but pretty darn close to the most conservative district. And that makes a very interesting mix, the young um, conservatives, and they care about this climate, this environment, and they want me to care. And it's it sent me on a journey. Um, I came as a just three years ago and not understanding so many of these issues, and it's been quite a journey for me. And um, I'm convinced of several things. One is that Republicans care deeply about the environment. We've allowed ourselves to be branded as not caring, but we do care. We've got to do a better job of articulating that. Now, I'd like to kind of uh, contrast two kind of uh, things that I hear frequently here in Washington, D.C. Um, it seems like every executive, um, whether they represent oil or, or energy, will say, hey, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. I'm even hearing by 2030. And uh, then they, they always follow that up with two things. 
And that is, um, I can only do that um, with nuclear. And um, I can't fully get there without innovation that doesn't currently exist. And we just need to embrace the fact that if these goals are realistic, that we want to be carbon neutral by 2050. And, and I actually think a better goal is redu reducing worldwide carbon. Um, that's, that's more important uh, to me. Uh, we can't get there without nuclear. Now, let me share a story with you. In Utah, we have uh, several organizations that represent municipal power. I had the opportunity to chair one of those, Utah Municipal Power Authority. There's a sister agency called UAMPS. For years, uh, they have been trying to put together a nuclear um, as, a, as a power source uh, and to buy nuclear. And they want to start a small nuclear reactor uh, project. And I've watched them go through this. They're committed, they're, they're, they're working hard on the financing and it is near impossible. And the barriers that government has put in the way make it near impossible for somebody who's willing to do this, who wants to invest. And I think that's something we need to look long and hard at is uh, um, how can we simplify this? And I, and I hear my good friends who say they have concerns with nuclear. This is the cool thing. Let's innovate past those concerns. Let's put those concerns out on the table. Let's find the innovation to get past them. And I, I have no doubt that we can do that and um, that we need to do that. And uh, with that, so pleased to be with you uh, and I yield my time. Thank you, Congressman. I, I, I like how you frame it. Let's innovate past those concerns. And I think we'll um, discuss some of those concerns in our expert panel that follows, but we really appreciate your um, leadership uh, in, in, the, in the house on this and working really closely with your colleagues. Thank you for being with us. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. For our second part of our program, uh, we're grateful to be joined by four people with strong expertise on nuclear energy issues. We have uh, Jennifer Gordon, Managing Editor and Senior Fellow with the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Jeremy Harrell, Managing Director for Policy with ClearPath. We have Wells Griffith, most recently Managing Director and Senior Advisor to the CEO for Energy with the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. And we also have Aaron Weston, a nuclear energy expert with the Idaho, Idaho National Lab. Thanks so much to each of you for lending your time and insights this morning. I'd like to give each of you a few minutes to share your perspective on the importance of new nuclear energy before we jump into questions and answers. We talked with a number of Hill offices in advance of our conversation today to get their input on some of the questions that they have. Um, so I'd like to uh, turn it over to you in a second. In the meantime, for everyone who's tuning in to our YouTube live page, you'll see a chat box in the right of your screen. So please use this to enter any questions you would like to ask the panel um, in, in, in the time that we have together. Uh, please also include your name and affiliation if you'd like the panelists to know who you are. We'll be pulling from some of the questions in this chat box to help populate our discussion. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Jennifer. Uh, I know that you have a great perspective um, in, 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 on nuclear issues stemming from your work at the Atlantic Council's Global, Global Energy Center. So curious to know your perspective here. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Um, and I also wanna thank the International Conservation Caucus Foundation for inviting me to speak with you all this morning. Um, so I think you know one thing that I really want to um, say today, given this opportunity, um, is that just the fact that we're having this discussion at all, I think, goes to show you the extent to which nuclear energy policy is something that has truly bipartisan support. Um, and just having heard from Senator Whitehouse, from representatives Young and Curtis, um, you know, I think that we can see that there is so much support behind nuclear energy policy that we all realize that number one, we cannot get to net zero without nuclear energy, that we absolutely need it in our energy mix. Um, and two, I think, you know, that we need to see nuclear energy. And I think that, you know, I hope that certainly that the Biden administration will continue to see it in this way as we have seen in the last four years. Um, as you know, a critical tool for enhancing US national security and just understanding the value of nuclear energy for national security, number one, in that it helps to strengthen diplomatic ties, um, and two, just the geopolitical importance of having it be the US and our allies who are exporting nuclear energy technologies. So let me stop there and turn it back to you, Chrissy. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for those top level thoughts. And I look forward to Di diving further into them later on in the discussion. 
Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over, over to Jeremy Harrell of ClearPath. I know that you and your organization has done a ton of work on uh, energy innovation with a special focus on nuclear. Uh, would love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Chrissy. I really appreciate it. And thank you to the International Conservation Caucus Foundation. And thank you to uh, Rep. Curtis, uh, Rep. Young, and Senator Whitehouse. I mean, three of our, our foremost ex uh, experts and, and advocates in, in the clean energy space on Capitol Hill that have yielded huge bipartisan results over the, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, there's a lot exciting going on in this space, and I think that's why the bipartisan support continues to grow. For for a long period of time, uh, advanced nuclear was seen as uh, as a distant uh, a dream, a uh, technology that could be used for our our future energy mix, you know, decades away. And and the time is now. Uh, the industry has hit some really big milestones over the last couple years. Um, we've had some significant public policy wins because policymakers see that there's ways that they can help accelerate clean energy innovation and bring these new technologies to, to the forefront. Um, New Scale getting its design certification last year, meaning that uh, they've got a stamp of approval to, to uh, on uh, on the safety of their design, regardless of whether uh, where they would build it or or where they would put it forward. Oaklo, the uh, the micro reactor company that uh, um, put forth the first non light water uh, combined construction operating license at the NRC and starting to move through that process. Um, two big exciting awards are made by the Department of Energy with strong utility support, the X Energy and Natrium reactor, uh, the Natrium design being a, um, a collaboration between Bill Gates' TerraPower and GE Hitachi, all focused on deploying in the mid-2020s. Um, and so we really have this wave of over the next decade, four or five different new uh, American designs just on the reactor side um, that uh, are likely to, to come to fruition and show that they're a commercially viable uh, option as we look to seize an immense global market. Um, and it's not just on the reactor side. New advanced fuels are coming and moving forward and, and getting cleared. There's a real economic development opportunity, a real uh a role for nuclear to play in accelerating our decarbonization objectives, as Mr. Curtis uh, mentioned. I mean, if we have any hope of meeting uh, some of these ambitious goals of 2035 or even mid-century, uh, nuclear is going to be essential to meeting it from a, both a cost, affordability, and a reliability, re reliability standpoint. And so I'm really excited about the future ahead and, and looking forward to talking a little bit more about it. Thanks, Chrissy. That's awesome. Thanks, Jeremy, for those milestones. Um, it's really interesting to see all that um, great work coming out of the private sector. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to Wells Griffith. Uh, you've led a lot of really important work over the past few years in this area, especially during your time at DFC. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the financing piece and the important role that nuclear plays geopolitically? Yeah, thanks, Christy, and, and thanks for, for the ICCF for hosting us and Chairman uh, Dave Barron and President John Gant. Um, appreciate it. You all organizing this important and bipartisan uh, discussion. Uh, you know, I, I really love it, nuclear energy. I like all energy, but I think um, it's, it's very much a, a great space uh, for bipartisan cooperation uh, because depending on what your policy priority is, whether it's achieving net zero, if it's supporting U.S. competitiveness in the nuclear enterprise, if it's um, advancing U.S. energy security and that of our partners and allies, or if it's uh, pr uh, providing access to affordable emission-free baseload power in emerging economies to help with economic growth and development. Um, it's really a great you know, space, I think, for, for bipartisan cooperation. Uh, recently, I was at the DFC and uh, led the effort to uh, modernize the nuclear policy to allow for uh, nuclear financing um, in, in eligible countries. I think, um, you know, it, it, there was a prohibition for the last 10 years um, one thing in that process, we, yeah, many of you may, may be aware of, um, you know, it was, I think, surprising a little how much broad bipartisan support there was for that change, really because of the realization of, of the, the reasons I mentioned, the policy priorities I mentioned uh, before. Um, but we had over 800 uh, comments during the public uh, notice and comment period. Uh, it was about 90, I want to make sure I get this, it was, um, 98% were in favor, largely for a diverse, broad um, reasons, not just climate change, not just national security, but really highlighted all of them and the importance of, of, of them. Uh, we also had broad uh, bipartisan support, both um, with uh, members of Congress, Senator Coons, Senator Whitehouse, Murkowski, uh, Manchin, many others, and in the NGO space um, as well, both, again, from both, uh, both both sides of the aisle. 
And I think, you know, that, that I guess the main takeaway here, I, I think to, to, I would like to emphasize is that um, there was, was a little bit surprising how much bipartisan support, but I think it's really an area, and while we're having this discussion today, that, that both sides can come together and, and have, a, you know, very uh, in, impactful discussions and continue to move the ball forward um, to advance, you know, multiple policy priorities for the U.S. government and our allies and partners. So thanks again. Look forward to this discussion. Awesome. Thanks for that, Wells. Um, yeah, and it's really interesting to, it's interesting to hear um, stemming from uh, your stakeholder outreach, how bipartisan um, this issue really is. Um, last but not least, I'd like to turn it over to Aaron Weston with Idaho National Labs. I know he's held a, a number of roles, um, important policy making roles on nuclear energy. Uh, would love to hear from you about some of the exciting work coming out of the labs and more from your perspective. Sure, thanks, Chrissy. It's great to be here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been exciting over the past few years. Now I think the Congress has passed um, three three bills that are focused on nuclear innovation just in the last maybe two, two and a half years. Um, so the lab system, you know, of course, supports all energy, provides uh, the technical um, skill sets, uh, materials, in some cases where needed, and um, infrastructure to support um, innovation in all areas, but certainly in nuclear, which is probably the hardest one because it's so intensely regulated, the lab system is critical to helping um, do things like innovating past the concerns um, that um, the congressman mentioned. Um, so, you know, just for example, um, Idaho National Lab provides technical support to the DOD's transportable reactor program. And um, that's a pretty interesting one. It could certainly make a big dent in uh, decarbonizing the defense sector or for civilian applications could contribute there as well. They think um, roughly each reactor uh, would be about 1.5 megawatts, so operating for about three years. That's about almost 3 million gallons of diesel. Not to mention where a lot of these installations are located, uh, that doesn't account for the fact that to move the diesel uh, fuel constantly to those locations, there's a lot more that's going to go into that. So that's something I, I think we're in a DOD, like around 60,000 tons of carbon just for the, the diesel fuel alone. Um, Let's see, uh, the, the, the labs also support efforts like, um, you know, this nuclear innovation topic of um, uh, hydrogen production from currently operating commercial reactors. So um, anyone who follows nuclear probably knows that actually probably the biggest challenge for nuclear is the economics, you know, uh, getting the private sector to want to adopt these technologies. There's some uh, commercial risk, of course. So for the currently operating reactors, even some of them have... Um, found themselves in financial trouble. But if those reactors could also um, use the, the heat that is not currently uh, generating uh, revenue towards hydrogen production, there will be an additional source of income. And of course, also do quite a bit to contribute to the um, effort to mitigate climate change. So those are just a couple of things that come to mind um, when I think about uh, the, you know, what the labs, uh, what, what Idaho National Lab is doing, what the, the lab system is doing. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kind of answer other questions and, uh, you know, really kind of just join the chat. It's been a while um, <laughs> and I wish I could be there on the Hill, but uh, it's still fun to be engaged uh, with the Hill audience. It's true, we do miss you here in DC, but happy that you're doing, uh, leading so much good work in, in Idaho. So grateful that you can be with us virtually today. Um, so I want to draw two things out of Aaron's um, recent comments. I think the uh, innovation piece is really important. Uh, I saw Jennifer and Jeremy, I saw a lot of nodding from you both on there. So I certainly want your, your thoughts there. Um, and then also the financing challenges. I think Wells has um, particular in, um, insight there. Uh, so let's let's start on the energy innovation. Um, in our conversations with offices, we've heard a lot of questions. Um, Jeremy, you started off with listing some important milestones. Uh, could you elaborate a little further? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat just briefly to show you optically. Um, and this timeline will show you a little bit, and, and it's busy, and that's a good thing because there's a lot going on. 
a lot of new designs, both on the uh, reactor side and the fuel side, that are coming to fruition in, over the next decade. And you'll see there at the very bottom the, the SCO program that that Aaron was mentioning that he was really instrumental in launching when he's at the White House. So I want to give him kudos because I think it's got both a huge impact, both uh, on the the domestic on the uh, the military side and reducing emissions on that front, and can have a, a big role in accelerating the innovation of uh, of non-light water designs because of its ability to, to give us some some clear material and testing uh, data that's going to be necessary to license new designs moving forward. But um, as you can see, there's a lot of things that are, are moving forward. The new scale uh, design cert, which I mentioned, Oklo moving forward, G Hitachi small module reactor just entered pre-application at the NRC. Um, and these things are, are, are not just science projects. And you know, I'll point out the uh, the Kairos uh, Hermes project. I mean, they just announced they're going to hire over 100 people in in Tennessee and in, in the in eastern Tennessee as they work to to build that demonstration project. I mean, these projects are are going to create U.S. jobs, advance um, our national security imperative. A lot of those different designs are are, are different uh, structures. You know. Uh, um, the, the Terra Power designs a, a fast reactor. X Energy is a high temperature gas reactor. So it's really exciting. There's kind of like some flagship designs in, in a, across the spectrum that have different applications. You know, X Energy's high temperature gas reactor could have industrial uh, heat process uh, uh, applications as well. I mean, nuclear really has a role to play kind of across um, the economy, whether it's providing uh, clean electricity, um, clean process heat for, for industrial manufacturing, and we need high temperatures to make steel, things like that, that we currently use combustion to do. And then, uh, you know, there's a big focus. I'm sure staff has seen a lot of, uh, written about hydrogen recently, and the, and the DOE is starting to partner on how do we use uh, both uh, existing nuclear and advanced reactors uh, for hydrogen production, and, and it could be another value stream for these for these designs or uh, different applications that help uh, decarbonize both the transportation and the industrial sector. So there's a lot of really exciting things going on on the innovation side. Uh, really kudos to to our congressional uh, audience here that that are on on uh, tuning in because um, a, a lot of the the work that's happening in the labs is a result of significant uh, investments that have been made in the last four fiscal years. Um, that uh, key awards that were made by the previous administration at the Department of Energy and stuff that I think that the Biden administration is going to carry forward because they were smart policies to, to, to advance. And then as Aaron mentioned, you know, for over a decade, we didn't have a nuclear specific legislation enacted in the law. And in the last two and a half years, we've seen uh, legislation to modernize the NRC's regulatory process, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act, which is giving the labs uh, new, new tools to partner with private, the private sector. And then last year's big energy bill had the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, uh, which was focused on demonstrating these new, new designs and, and, and showing that the U.S. has uh, exciting new commercial products. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting to see um, how much innovation is occurring in this sector and how it really takes a partnership uh, with the, the research community, uh, the private sector, policymakers here in D.C., um, it's very, very interesting. It actually begs a question that we just received in the chat box, which is what did the previous administration do to help nuclear technology advance and how can we expect, uh, what can we expect from the current one? I think it follows really nicely from um, the insight that you just shared, Jeremy. Um, uh, Jennifer, would you like to talk a little bit about, um, to, to recap a little bit here about what we saw from the past administration and what we can expect from the next one, from this current sure. one? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, so Jeremy gave you know just an excellent overview of some of the legislation that we've seen in the last several years. Um, two things. Um, well, Wells obviously talked about the the DFC uh, lifting its, uh, its its nuclear project finance ban, and um, Chrissy, of course, you're the expert on Exim and the re reauthorization that also occurred under the Trump administration. So I think that you know going into the Trump administration. If we had all sat down and said, "What is our policy wish list?" Um, I think that you know we would have ticked off those um, you know those issues right off the bat. So you know we were able to see that. I think it was really fantastic, um, and I do think that you know the the, the chess pieces now are set to carry forward um, this really great policy, both in, you know th these great policies in terms of streamlining innovation domestically. Um, and then also, I think, really enabling and strengthening our civil nuclear export program. Um, at the same time, I would just caution and say that, you know, we do have to remember that we're competing against Russian and Chinese state-owned enterprises. And so 
there is still, I think, much, much more work to be done. Um, and there are more opportunities to make sure that we really are able to put together competitive financing packages um, and to just proactively go out to countries um, and make sure that, you know, we're all connecting in the right ways to, um, you know, to really make sure that we are the ones, the United States and our allies are the ones whose technologies are chosen, um, you know, when it comes time for the international bids. Great insight. Um, I'd love to hear the same question over to, over to Wells. Um, curious, I know we, we touched on some of the important work that you played a key role in during your time at DFC, um, and, and you talked to, uh, about the bipartisan nature of this issue. Um, could, we, could you share some more thoughts about what the previous administration did to help on nuclear technology and some thoughts on challenges and opportunities facing this current one? Yeah, I think um, you know there, there was a, a, a lot in the innovation space as well as the financing and, and really I think the recognition of the importance of nuclear going forward again for whatever policy priority um, you know is the the primary focus for whichever administration or policymaker you know from a, from the financing perspective you know as Jennifer mentioned there is there is not a level playing field uh, financing nuclear power projects is a is a complex process um, for sure. Um, and when we're competing against uh, state-owned and state-backed financing from Russia and China, um, it, it makes it even more difficult. So there is a lot more work that needs to be done. I think um, you know DFC was just a small step to bring some additional financing there. I think recognizing the the ESG qualities of nuclear financing, helping you know, expanding into other public sector financing as well as private financing to to strengthen that um, from a free market. Um, Kind of perspective, you know, this this the geopolitics, the national security piece. I think of nuclear is we're competing um, for continued global leadership, which also brings with it, from a U.S. perspective, the highest levels of safety, security, and nonproliferation. Um, and when and those uh, the financing packages being presented by uh, the state-owned entities, Russia, China, is is not is not as much about the economics as, as it is about the geopolitics in the long-term uh, relationship. So I think there's, um, you know, the, the innovation will continue. And, and again, if, if the more innovation we're, we're, we're doing here, there still are challenges in, in getting that commercially deployed to prove the technology and bring it to market. And I think there's, uh, you know, opportunities there, but also, um, you know, expanding, um, kind of really increasing the availability of financing and, and mitigating some of that risk um, for private sector is something that can, will need to continue as well. Great, thanks for that insight. Yeah, I do think the competitiveness uh, implications are really interesting, especially given that other countries are gaining speed and exporting their technologies within nuclear, but also in many other highly innovative technologies like wireless technology. Um, what can policymakers do? What can, for, for the staff that's on the call, um, what recommendations do you have for how members of Congress can cultivate this important technology, continue to work with the private sector and commercialize it, uh, but also ensure um, US, uh, US leadership and, and close partnership with our allies on this important topic? Um, I see Jeremy, you nodding. Would you like to take a first crack at this one? Sure, I'd be happy to. I, I think there, there are a few different areas. Uh, I think the biggest uh, biggest thing is uh, oversight. Uh, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission made a lot of progress over the last couple of years under Chair Savinicki. Um, we were really encouraged that the Biden administration named Chris Hansen uh, chair of, of the commission moving forward um, and just moving efficiently through the licensing process and taking up these new issues and right-sizing regulations to fit the new nature of small modular reactors and advanced reactors are a huge part of the puzzle. Um, if our advanced developers are ready to get licensed and build, but our NRC is not caught up with the times, uh, it's a huge problem. Um, I think the same thing on the DOE, there's some key partnerships on that front, the advanced reactor demonstration program, things along those lines, got to hold their feet to the fire and ensure that these, these programs are working with industry to bring these new technologies forward. Uh, Congress needs to fund these programs. You know, the the, the bill that was enacted at the end of, of last Congress, um, it, you know, authorizes some big cost shares to ensure that we can commercially demonstrate these new designs and show uh, show that they're a commercially viable uh, product. And then, you know, as we look at broader clean energy policy and climate policy as a whole, we need to be tech inclusive. 
Um, it, climate is too big of a problem to be having these technology wars. And I think Don Young actually articulated this really well earlier. It's not about renewables versus nuclear versus CCUS. We need all the clean tools in the in the in the tool on the tool belt uh, to have any shot at meeting some deep emissions reductions and, and accelerating a clean energy transition. And so all policies need to be looking about how do we reduce emissions, not about how do we prop up certain uh, technologies. And so uh, whether it's tax policy and, and, and things along those lines, we need to be sure we're putting clean tech on a level playing field and letting them uh, commercially deploy and, and, and move forward. And so I think that's something that's really important for policymakers to keep in mind over the next couple of years. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Aaron, I'd love to hear from you on this point too. Um, I know on a, you know, for, you, you've spent a lot of time on the Hill and probably have a lot of uh, insight on, on this as well. It feels like a long time since I've been on the Hill though, but um, um, yeah, well, I think my, you know, my philosophy um, is that first, um, you know, the Congress should always engage in constructive oversight to ensure the execution and implementation of the laws that it passes. So that kind of sounds a little bit cliche, but, you know, as, as I said, you know, it's, it's been exciting to watch the Congress pass these three bills in the last two some years. So, um, you know, staying engaged with the agencies, ensuring that those laws are being implemented in the way that that uh, the Congress expects them to, uh, that the, the projects stay on track, that the um, regulatory reforms, as Jeremy uh, mentioned, that those are being implemented in the way that um, is consistent with the with the with the views from or the the sort of vision from especially those congressional leaders who were involved in that legislation. Um, and then I think, you know, when they're, uh, when staff are thinking about, okay, well, what, what else can, can, can they do? Um, well, you know, when you see like larger vehicles moving forward, they're focused on climate change mitigation or some sort of large energy effort, environmental effort. Um, you know, if they have the view that nuclear um, should be part of that, probably ensuring and, and, and that, that, that nuclear energy is um, kind of recognized as being a component or a tool in that in that set. Um, you know, what I've found is that often, since nuclear is a bit more complicated, it brings in other technical dimensions like non-proliferation, like Wells mentioned, that that's not something that's relevant to some other energy technology. So, um, but yet, um, you know, the, the market for nuclear energy, really a lot of it's the global market. And then that typically gonna will invoke these questions of nuclear proliferation. So that in itself is an entirely separate dimension of nuclear energy. And I'm sure there will be plenty of discussions that will come up in the in the future about um, you know, global decarbonization, whether it's just our energy exports or it could be more of a nuclear specific matter. And I think those are the things that you know staff who are interested in this subject um, you know, would certainly find rewarding to pay attention to and contribute to, especially if they're if their um, boss is on one of the um, you know, foreign relations or uh, foreign affairs committees. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, I guess in short, it's like when you think about, you know, what, what role the Congress has, it's funding, obviously, the government's operations, but that can be both on the supply part as far as um, some sort of innovation to develop a product or really in that policy effort that affects the market. Um, a lot's gone in recently to helping the products move along. And, you know, like I said, it feels like forever, but I left the Hill about four years ago. I think that since I left now, you do see there are some, some projects that are certainly underway and on track to completion, but yet for those things to thrive and actually make a contribution, there have to be buyers. There has to be a market. So, um, you know, I can't, I don't have anything specific to say right now, as far as like, you know, uh, of any particular uh, policy discussion or legislative vehicle that I'm aware of, but I, I think there'll be plenty of things there. Um, you know, going forward, uh, you know, in, in the area of the sort of market related policies. Yeah, important stuff to keep in mind. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the time that we have left, uh, before we move to closing thoughts, uh, I do want to uh, throw out one more question. Uh, we talked a lot about the innovation piece. We talked a lot about financing challenges, and we also talked about the geopolitical importance. Um, I want to dive in a little bit further on uh, energy security. Uh, I know that's a hot topic um, here in, in um, you know, close uh, on Capitol Hill right now. Um, policymakers, uh, talk about this in the context of critical minerals, rare earth materials, um, but I'd, I'd love to get this group's thoughts on um, energy security in the context of nuclear energy before we move to closing thoughts. 
uh, Jennifer Wells, we haven't heard from uh, either of you recently, so would love to hear hear your thoughts on, on energy security. Sure, thanks, Chrissy. Um, so I think in terms of energy security, you know, nuclear energy is essentially a domestic energy source. Um, and it is always there. Um, I think that when you look at pairing it with renewables, especially when you get into the small modular reactors, they have the capability to ramp up and ramp down very quickly. And so I think we all had a bit of a crash course um, earlier this year, looking at Texas on what energy security actually means. And you know, this idea that when you turn the lights on in your home, the, ha the, the energy has to be you know, created at the source to meet exactly what that energy demand is. So if you think that energy security means will that energy demand be met instantly, then yes, nuclear energy absolutely has that technical capability to do that. Um, and I think that, you know, as we move forward and as we try to hit the, the goal of achieving net zero by 2050 and decarbonizing the power sector by 2035, um, I think that nuclear energy is essential in that mix. Excellent, thanks for those thoughts. Any last thoughts uh, from you, Wells, on energy security? No, I mean, I, I would just echo Jennifer. I mean, nuclear energy is one of the most secure and resilient forms of sources of energy. And I think mm -hmm. going forward, again, um, it provides uh, base load power that can balance out well with intermittent sources um, in this, you know, um, go in the future, not just in the United States, but really in help countries achieve their their climate goals as well as their their economic and, and energy related policies as well. Excellent, thank you. Well, good. We're close to the forty five minute mark, which is uh, where where I'd like us to close. But before we do, I'd love to turn it over to each of you for some closing thoughts. Jeremy, would you like to start? Yeah, I, I guess I, I would just say that it's a really exciting time to be working in the clean energy space. There's a ton of momentum in, in this area. And I think it's exciting that, that nuclear is a big part of it. Um, and so I think there's some big opportunities for policymakers uh, moving forward uh, as we kind of follow through on some of the, the momentum that, that uh, has come forward over the last couple of years on the public policy front and, and capitalizing on the private sector opportunities. You know, as, as Wells was talking a little, and Jennifer were talking a little bit about the geopolitical, like this is a huge global market and there is significant uh, global demand for advanced nuclear technologies. I think energy security is a big part of that and driving down the cost of these type of technologies so that when we look at the developing world or we, or we look at some of these big energy consumers that we forecast like like India, China, um, uh, many African countries, um, they're going to need uh, clean, cheap, clean energy. And these are the type of technologies that can help really have a footprint on the global clean energy picture. Because in the end, we can do a lot here in the United States and I think we should lead absolutely should lead in, in, in the energy transition. But uh, it's about proliferating, or proliferating is the wrong word in the nuclear sense, uh, uh, the wide distribution of uh, a clean energy assets and technologies um, uh, throughout the globe to, to drive down global emissions. Great points. Aaron? Um, well, I think, you know, um, you know, thanks again for having me. I think the other panelists really kind of hit the main points. Um, I guess just again to kind of represent INL and the labs, um, you know, it is an exciting time. Uh, we see quite a few sort of, I think, projects underway. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, the labs are excited to help provide that expertise, resources, material uh, in, in partnership with the Department of Energy. Um, uh, you know, to, hopefully to see these things to completion. Um, you know, I guess, um, like I say, as far as my last thought, I guess it would, be, yeah, probably more focused on what, what everyone else was talking about as far as the, the bigger picture, the, the sort of geopolitical implications. Um, you know, uh, I think in the United States, in each case, you're going to need to see first a reactor built here. But then when you want those nth of a kind where you really want to make a dent in, in emissions, it's going to be out there. Um, and so when you look into that process, there's a lot that goes into, um, you know, the United States um, requirements to export a reactor. But there's a lot of benefit we get as well. I guess that's just one thing maybe uh, that no one really was able to mention all to say is um, if we sell a reactor to some emerging economy 
that wants to, you know, um, be carbon neutral. Well, we're forming what people say is about a century long relationship. That reactor is going to operate probably for 80 years. It'll take about 10 years to construct it. Also establish a regulatory system. That's something I think that from patriotic sense, the United States, and really from a global security perspective, the United States wants to do, right? We want to make sure that that new regulatory system is up and running to the, to the closest to our standards as possible. Um, we probably don't want to defer that to China or Russia, who are our chief competitors. Um, you know, the other players, France and South Korea, you know, they're obviously closer allies and we believe responsible and good at doing that. But, but you know, I think we all should probably hope that the U.S. would have a large role to play there. I mean, you know, the U.S. Uh, NRC is um, what many of us refer to as the gold standard for regulation and safety in the world. So um, anyway, that just all that, you know, presents a lot of opportunity for other um, national interests as well. So um, I guess I'll leave it there. I promise not to talk too much, but um, <laughs> I guess that would be my last thought is that, you know, uh, those other dimensions of nuclear, I think really require a lot of attention and thought. Mm -hmm. And um, those are both the challenges, but also can present a lot of the rewards that come with this as well. I think that's great. Well, I think the key word there is opportunity. Um, I think there's um, a lot uh, to be optimistic about considering um, what we've discussed here. Jennifer, do you have some closing thoughts to share? Yeah, thanks, Chrissy. Um, so I think, you know, one thing that I would like to leave the audience with today are just a sense of some of the numbers. So if in the United States, nuclear energy accounts for 20% of our electricity generation, but more than 50% of our clean electricity generation, and globally, those numbers are 10% of electricity generation worldwide, but 20% of clean electricity generation worldwide. We can see, I think, why we're expecting the global nuclear energy market to triple by 2050. So we're just going to see, as others have mentioned, just incredible, an incredible increase in demand. And I think, you know, to Aaron's point, what we wanna do is make sure again, that it is the United States and our allies who are meeting that demand. And so that we're competing against Russia and China, but we wanna be the ones who are selling nuclear energy technologies overseas. And I think, you know, whether that means that we proactively go out and seek one, two, three agreements with new nuclear countries, whether that means that we look at some of the legislation that Senator Whitehouse mentioned earlier, the American Nuclear Infrastructure Act, the Nuclear Energy Research and Development Act, and by the way, on the American Nuclear Infrastructure Act, you know, one of the key things is that it would revise the outdated Atomic Energy Act's um, foreign ownership control or domination restrictions. So it would make it much easier for our allies to cooperate with us, to co-finance with us, whether on builds in the United States or internationally. So I think, you know, we need to do all of these things. We need to keep making sure that all the policies are in place to make it even easier for us, for the United States, to realize our goals, which are, or which should be, um, exporting our civil nuclear technologies to meet that increased demand by 2050. Excellent, thank you, Jennifer. Wells, would you like to conclude with concluding thoughts? Yeah, just to kind of build on what, what, what the other, uh, our, my other panelists uh, said, I think, I think by really focus on the financing, you know, I think um, we've got a lot going on the in, the in the innovation space. I think there's some work that's going to have to be done and looked at in getting these new technologies uh, deployed for the first time to, to uh, you know, give confidence to the market uh, that they are commercially deployable and more attractive for private and public finance. I think um, both public and private finance underappreciate the ESG value of nuclear energy, both from a zero emission baseload um, power perspective. And there, there's, you know, we, we need to unlock more financing to make, to compete against the, the state back and authoritarian finance, um, but also acknowledge that, this, that there is real benefit here to achieving the, you know, the US and global climate and energy um, priorities uh, that also support uh, US foreign policy uh, and economic priorities as well. And then lastly, just I think we, just to kind of wrap it up would be, um, again, I think this is a very ripe sec space for uh, bipartisan cooperation and support. And we've seen a lot that's got, gotten us to this place. And I think really um, if, to solve what the you know, climate uh, priorities or geopolitical national security, I think 
in a town where things are sometimes divided, um, I would encourage uh, um, both sides to continue that and, and increase that support and cooperation in this space. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think that's an excellent note uh, to end on. Um, I think this is um, a significant area of opportunity for um, uh, bipartisan cooperation. Um, so thank you to each of you uh, for sharing your insights today. I know I learned a lot. I hope our audience learned a lot. Uh, many thanks also to the members who joined us today. Uh, thank you to Senator Whitehouse, uh, Congressman Young and Congressman John Curtis. Um, we are grateful for all of your partnership uh, and look forward to continuing to work with you on this issue and many others. So thanks again for joining.